absolute. This is episode 42 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Today's guest is one of my trusted colleagues and absolute favorite people, Tamara Powell. Tamara has been on Women in Depth twice previously, sharing her insights and wisdom on the experience of spiritual abuse. Today's topic, Revisioning Relationships, arose out of a conversation Tamara and I had about the evolution of relationships how relationships have evolved beyond the acceptable and familiar heterosexual married couple with 2.5 kids, and what this means for individuals and society. In today's conversation, Tamara and I will explore some of the challenges that come with defining and labeling relationships, and regardless of what the relationship looks like or how it's structured, what are some of the components that are present in a healthy relationship? Tamara Powell is a licensed therapist, university psychology instructor, and spiritual empowerment coach who believes life should be lived as a journey that is anything but ordinary. She opened Aria Therapy Services as a way to provide holistic health and healing to a global market. With specialties in gender, sexual, erotic, and relational diversity, Tamara is passionate about holding sacred space for the self-identified misfits and mystics of the world, the healers, the visionaries, and the creatives. More recently, Tamara began Tales from a Trapezoid with a goal of pushing the envelope around the more raw and edgier sides of life and is dedicated to those who may often feel like a trapezoid in a world full of circles. Tamara also has a podcast called Undressing the Spirit where you can hear weekly explorations of mankind's search for passion and purpose. Hi, Tamara, and welcome to the podcast. Hey, Lourdes. Always a pleasure. Thank you for being here. I'm excited because we're talking about a topic that comes up in therapy, comes up in life. It's everywhere. We experience it throughout the day, and that is relationships. Yeah, you can't breathe and not be in a relationship, I don't think. No, whether the relationship, you know, no matter what it, what kind of relationship it is and what the experience is, is like, you know, we are relational creatures. Absolutely. I think we're hardwired for it, even neurochemically. There's been a lot in the media lately about loneliness and the impact of not having a relationship, like just health-wise on, on longevity. It just shows you that we, we're not an island. Absolutely not. And I know it's true in my clinical practice, and I'd venture to guess probably yours as well, that clients could absolutely have everything else in their life under control, so to speak. Like they might be king or queen of their domain, and if they're not feeling lit up in a relational manner, um, I tend to see symptoms of anxiety and depression. Absolutely. You know, that's a good point. You know, I'm, I'm thinking now about clients I've worked with and currently work with, and it's interesting how... So much can be, you know, going well, and in the relationship realm, there's a little bit more of a challenge or a struggle. Yes, absolutely. So today we're going to be focusing on a specific part or aspect of relationship, and this is basically, I guess, defining relationship and how these definitions can help or hurt or help a relationship to evolve. When when it comes to defining relationships, I was just thinking about that's in preparing for this conversation. And we in the English, we who speak the English language, we have one word to kind of encapsulate a relationship that's meaningful and intimate. And that's basically the word love. You know, and mm -hmm. it's interesting because the ancient Greeks, you know, they had at least six words for love, you know, and I'm just going to read some of these off to you really quickly. Um, so one of them is eros, which is basically you know, sexual passion. And mm -hmm. um, it was named after the word comes from the Greek god of fertility. And then the other word they had was philia, which is deep friendship. And the Greeks actually valued deep friendship 
far more than the sexuality of Eros, mm -hmm. you know? And this philia was something that was uh, seen in men and women. It, it wasn't, you know, confined to one gender or any gender. And so I think that's just interesting because, you know, we have friends on Facebook or followers on Twitter, but we don't really have a word that is like that deep friendship, that deep love in a friendship. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then another word they had um, was a playful love. And this is called, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's ludus, L-U-D-U-S, which, you know, this is kind of like the playfulness with children. It's also the flirting and teasing that can happen um, in a friendship or the early stages of a relationship, or or it can be laughing with friends, that bantering, that type I of I love thing. that. Mm -hmm. That's so you too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That's why I love that. And I was just like, Ludus, Lordus, that's fun. <laughs> there you go. And so I, I really did like that word. I'm like, that is, you know, we need more of that playful love. And then I don't also don't know if I'm pronouncing this one correctly. You, you, you might know. Is it agape or agape? How do you... Do you know agape. That? Agape. And this was selfless love. And this was a love that you extended to all people, uh, people you're, you knew, uh, pe distant strangers. And um, this was translated into Latin as caritas, which is the origin of the word charity. You know, so in Buddhism, it's that universal loving kindness. And um, I just think that this is also something that we, we don't really pay attention to or nurture. It's not a word, that, it's not an, an expression of love or experience of love that I think we even, um, unless we are really, you know, meditating a lot and, or doing some kind of um, spiritual practice, I don't know that we pay a lot of attention to this one. You're right. And I think that one's incredibly powerful. So for anyone who was brought up in the Christian church, the way that I was, agape love was the one that we were all supposed to attempt to embody. That was the Christ consciousness. That was what God did for humanity. And so that was that charity was, I think of it now as a counselor, as the Rogerian unconditional positive regard for yeah. all of humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, that that is what allows us to have empathy and compassion for others. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So then an, another word that the Greeks had was pragma. And this was longstanding love. And this was like the love that developed between individuals who'd been together a very, very long time. So this could be, you know, um, show up as a marriage or any other type of agreement between two individuals that withstood time. That's beautiful. I instantly think of pragmatic or, you know, what Sternberg's triangle will talk about being commitment. And you and I, you know, before the show, we're talking about different types of relationships and non-traditional styles even. And I know plenty of couples who have a commitment to one another and they've stayed together even without sex, their companions, or one might be gay or they're together for financial reasons and to discount their love yeah. just because it's not sexual, I think would be unfortunate. Yeah. I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because that is so true. I I also, you know, I I'm aware of those who are in relationships where it is that pragma and there there is not a sexual component. They may not even live together, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there is this deep deep, I would say that um that deep bond, the philia, the deep friendship. Yes. And mm -hmm. then there's the pragma, and, you know, if you know people who've, who've had this relationship for 20, 30 years, you know. Mm -hmm. Or 50 or 60. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. also, you know, I'm, I'm just going to add this in before I do the last word. I think part of what gets in the way of our um, our definitions of love, our limited definitions of love, is that we don't realize that love can change and that's okay. Right. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because you do see couples who, who go from maybe um, more of an eros, or, mm -hmm. which is the sexual love, and the philia, uh, or the, and they move into philia, and then that part of the relationship shifts, and they continue with the pragma, which is the longstanding love. Right, and a lot of couples will freak out if they're not well prepared for it, and I think that's where you know relationship therapists like you or I could come in. I know you work with individuals, but I think you can do plenty of relational counseling just for with one partner of helping them understand. You know, Sternberg talks about this, Gottman talks about this, about you know after the butterflies, then we actually move into a really sweet intimacy, and that can only happen absent the butterflies when literally we're freaking crazy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you are. I mean, the, the chemicals and everything. Yeah. Yes. Your brain's lit up like a freaking Christmas tree. So 
once that subsides, I'm like, oh, there you are. I can really relate to you in a new way. Yeah. So the last word that they have, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, is called philoshia, which is P-H-I-L-A-U-T-I-A. And Hmm. this was love of the self or self-love. And um, they, the, the Greeks were smart, really smart about this. You know, they obviously <laughs> put more thought into their, <laughs> their mm-hmm. vocabulary. Um, they realized that there were two types. One was um, more of an unhealthy self-love, like uh, more like, I guess, on the narcissist. Narcissist, yeah. yeah. Where you become self-obsessed. And, and then the healthier version was your self-compassion. And that's feeling secure in yourself. And, and because of this, you were able to be generous with your love for others. Well, Lord knows our society needs more of that one. Yeah. So I just thought that was, you know, interesting that, you know, that the Greeks had so many words to, um, to begin to describe this complex experience that we all have. But we, I, I don't, I think the only thing where we might have a really huge vocabulary to describe one thing would be for coffee, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> so true. I want my mocha latte with two shots of espresso with soy, right? Yeah, Instead exactly. Of- <laughs> I mean, it's a whole other language. You know, you go into a into a coffee shop. It it really is. And it's a totally different experience when you start hearing it come out of your children's mouth and you're like, I'm sorry, where did you learn that? Cause yeah. I'm the type of girl that's like, I'll just take an iced coffee with cream and sugar. And then here's my 14 year old. And she's one of those women that's like wants the really long, complicated one. So maybe, maybe we could do a personality test based on that. Or maybe we can even look at like ordering drinks at a Starbucks and compare all the varieties to all the different kinds of relationships. <laughs> Ooh, that could be a great <laughs> podcast side note for us or okay. blog, definitely. <laughs> we'll pin a note in that for later. Okay. For sure. <laughs> so what do you think is is a healthy relationship? You know, if you were to to begin to describe it, what do you think um, the components would be? Oh, tall order there. Um, <clears throat> a healthy relationship, number one, needs to have, in my opinion, flexibility, yet stability, right? There's that beautiful tension line between I'm going, I'm willing to, as you were talking before, to grow and adapt with you and with myself, giving myself permission to grow and change and evolve. Because if you're not growing, right, they say you're dying. <laughs> like, right, hopefully right. we're all on this evolved journey to, you know, becoming the best version of ourselves. And so a relationship, meaning a connection with anything, even at myself and anything outside of myself needs to have that ability to both flow and adapt, but also have that constancy, that loyalty, that unconditional positive regard that no matter what you grow into, that I'm here for you. Yeah. So it's almost like that foundation, that groundedness allows for the, for the dynamic shifting and changing that can happen. And that's needed. Beautiful way of putting it. Yes, exactly. For me, I was thinking that um, just in what I've noticed with myself, with clients, mm-hmm. that another component of um, a healthy relationship would be the individual, the, each individual or, or however many are in the relationship right. are all in healthy relationship with themselves or, and or are continually working on themselves as a person. Yes, that's something I'm constantly preaching, for lack of a better word, to the (laughs) online community at large (laughs) and also to my private clients that I kind of look at it like a triangle that, you know, two partners start out towards the base of the triangle on either side. And as we both continue working on ourselves, we inevitably get closer to one another. It's a really beautiful paradox. Yeah. And, and, you know, shifting the attention away from... um, the other person or persons mm-hmm. and and what you're not happy with and what you wish they would do differently and really looking back at yourself. Yes. That's choice theory 101. I'm a big choice theory girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's 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 yeah. interesting, you know, you mentioned it earlier about earlier about doing um, you know, working with individuals. Um, and I and I I call it, you know, like relationship therapy for one. You know, you can do a yes. lot of work and have great relationships and be an individual in therapy. And oftentimes, I'm going to propose that it even goes easier. So if I get stuck with the client in session, 
Sometimes I will propose that we split off and do individual work. Either I will work with both partners separately or I will send one of them off to work with another one and then we, we come back because sometimes couples get very triggered by one another yeah. and they don't, they're don't not able to focus on their side of the tracks when the yeah. other person's in the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost like um, you know, you, you're not aware that you know, of what's your stuff, what's their stuff, right? what's the relationship stuff. And really, if, if each of you can figure out what you're bringing in that may, get in, may be getting in the way, address that, and then come together and work on the relationship. Oh my gosh, I mean, it's just such an advantage. It really, really is. And one of my favorite girl crushes, Esther Perel, right? She's, she's so amazing. But she, she talks about the importance of even before we're in a relationship with someone else, focusing on how do we want to be perceived in the relationship? What is it that we want to offer? Because our culture so often has it understandably backwards, right? Human beings can't help but enjoy that dopamine feeling we were talking about earlier, like the butterflies. This person gives me butterflies. They Mm -hmm. must be good for me. Um, They make me feel good about myself. And they miss a really powerful, in my opinion, empowering component of the reason this lover may be good for me is because they they mirror back to me the parts of myself that I enjoy being able to give. So the example that I often use with clients is like, if I enjoy being a nurturer in a relationship, I'm probably not going to do well with someone who is really high on the independence continuum and does not want to be taken care of. (laughs) Right, right, right. So it's not that, you know, they're being an a-hole or that they're a bad partner. They just may not be good for me because that's not how I want to be experienced in the relationship. And I think that's really a lot more powerful than how are you going to make me feel? Right, right. And I think too that something that that can happen with um, relationships is that because we in general aren't aware that we can have so many different types of relationships, um, I think, you know, I would say in general here, at least in America, and probably most of the Western world, it's either we're either friends or we're in an intimate relationship or we're having sex randomly. Or like, right? I mean, would that be pretty much what the the types of relationships are that people would identify yes, as for now? I, I, I mean, like, ab- yeah. Absolutely. And I think that does us a disservice because we end up walking around with these very rigid schemas and it we end up missing out on subtle nuances and moments with other people when our psyche doesn't know where to filter them into. It's like, I don't have a folder for this. <laughs> like, yeah. where, I, I don't have that file folder. Where does this go? <laughs> right. And so I think conversations like the one we're having today is so necessary to recognize like you don't need a stinking box. There is no box. Yeah. And I think too that, you know, so we were t- and I, the original question was, What do you think makes a healthy relationship? I think, um, you know, with relationships, opening ourselves to what this relationship is possibly here to teach me. Like you said, you used the example earlier of if if this relationship mirrors back to me and I'm able to be the nurturer I want to be, so that's one type of relationship. But I think another place where people get stuck is they'll have a relationship that didn't go well. And Mm -hmm. and that can be any continuum from it just didn't go well to it was really, really awful. And then um, there's this sense of, you know, I'm terrible at relationships, I'm a failure, blah, 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 when that relationship had something very specific for them to teach them and, and a gift. And I see this in all relationships. I mean, I might offend some people if I say this, but even with people who end up maybe having an affair or those who are in a relationship mm-hmm. that's abusive, those relationships mm-hmm. have gifts for the individual um, and opportunity. Absolutely. I've experienced both of those. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's not that I would wish that upon anyone, but yeah. I think a very healthy, empowered psyche is able to dig through the rubble to find the treasure in this. How can I use this to better myself along the journey? And, you know, having come from not one but two difficult marriages, I, I can't ever say that I regret them. I wouldn't wish them upon anyone once again. Yes. But I I learned things about myself of, oh, I really don't like whatever, fill yeah. in the blanks. And oh, I really am a lot more resilient than I once thought I was. And oh, these core values are incredibly important to me. And if I'm 
really good at looking at the shadow side. I can pick on, pick up on new nuances of things like, wow, I do tend to be impulsive when I'm triggered. Like when somebody makes me uncomfortable, I'm the one that typically wants to walk out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just me. Big shocker there. So having to learn to increase my distress tolerance when in a relationship that just because someone's upset with me, that's okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think too that, you know, so again, expanding our definition of relationship, you know, relationship doesn't mean you're going to be happy and have the house with a picket fence and, you know, the 2.5 right. children, you know, that may not be the purpose of all relationship. I think no. I think many relationships are here in our lives to push us towards growth and evolution that wouldn't happen if we weren't put in these if we didn't put ourselves into these um difficult spaces. Hell yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's interesting you say that. I read an article just the other day on starter marriages, kind of like a starter home. Yeah. And they were attempting to normalize the experience <laughs> for a lot of us that, you know, got married really young. And yeah, we learned from them, but yeah. they were not they were not our forever person. Yeah. And not wanting to then, you know, throw it away. I see so many people really missing out on that beauty of digging through the rubble and finding the treasure in it. And I think we do damage to ourselves, both emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, when we attempt to erase an entire chapter of our lives because the ending was rough. Right. Or, you know, and and even going along with that, with the starter marriages, and not just starter marriages, you know, even marriages after, where it's difficult Mm -hmm. for a person to let go because letting go of this means, you know, whatever they decide it means, or because of the definition we have that it's supposed to be happily ever after with one person, that that's, that's what it means to be healthy or um, that you're doing well in relationship, which is really, I mean, what a, what a lie we tell ourselves, right? I mean, and yes, yeah. I still give into that stigma sometimes. (laughs) I I know it's a struggle. It's a struggle Uh not to. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, or even I was talking to another guest on the podcast, Dr. Sharon Cohen, and, um, you know, she was talking about how a lot of times people will, you know, when they don't want to date, they just want to find the one person. Yes. You know? <laughs> and they get so a- many of my clients preach. <laughs> right. And, and shifting that from, you know, every person you have coffee with or have a date with or, you know, have sex with, this is an opportunity to, to practice relationship skills to practice conversation, to practice how to exit a relationship. And it's and because these aren't going well, it's not a, I guess it's not a statement about your worth. Right. And on the flip side too, I want to add to that, had I had more of these boxes that we're talking about today or no box at all, pick your poison, <laughs> um, <laughs> I could have avoided a lot of heartache for myself, including attempting to make things more permanent that Probably, I probably could have escaped my entire last marriage if I had had the box of, I'm just baby stepping back into relationships. Yeah. And this is a place to, you know, once again, practice and heal from the first marriage, you know. But because my schema was still, you date and if you sleep with someone, you should probably marry that person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> right. I just, I think it's, it's healthy to have the like those Greek words you were describing, to have such a beautiful nuance and to be able to allow for a plethora of experiences. They don't have to look like one and done. Yeah. So can you think of any other, um, I guess, aspects of relationship that you feel would be, you know, these would be um, ones to to look for in a in a healthy relationship? Yes, no matter the the type of relationship, romantic or not, I think it's incredibly important to have a very healthy dose of respect for one another's autonomy, that I don't need Mm. you to agree with me on anything. It's so difficult for people, but that's not what makes a relationship meaningful. It's it's just not. (laughs) Wow, yeah. I see you, you see me, and we celebrate one another, whatever that is. That's a big one. I bet that if that was one that more people could learn to um, integrate into their relationships, we would probably have relationships that might last a little bit longer. Yes. And even parents with children, I have to say, like with my own daughters who are now 14 and 11, it's been incredibly 
empowering and comforting at times when I want to beat my head against the wall and be like, well, am I a bad parent? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. To be like, all right, Tams, let's not take their behavior personally. Just like you have feels, they have feels. And yeah. to gift them with their own path and their own journey. Oh my goodness. That's just been, it's done wonders for my set own satisfaction as a mother. Oh my gosh. That's one of my favorite quotes that you, you first said it I think around Christmas time last year. Yeah, it was. Did it was I? About, it was about, yeah, because it was about gifts. Give everyone the gift of oh, their yes. own journey. I absolutely love that. And I've told so many people. Oh, good. Sometimes I surprise myself. <laughs> so you're talking about autonomy. Mm -hmm. Another piece that I think is really important in relationships is authenticity. Yes. I think um, a lot of times people never show up for their relationship. And problems happen later because their true self is wanting to be seen and wanting to be sh wanting to be heard. And now, when this this authentic self um, makes their presence known, it creates problems. Absolutely, I think just as important as autonomy is, we <laughs> could, authenticity needs to be equal. Because I've worked with so many women and men, however, who, going back to the Esther Perel thing, we, we show up looking to get that validation and we become chameleons. Yeah. Um, and that, it's, it's not usually conscious, although sometimes it is. We're like, oh, I can tell that this guy or girl that I really want to hang out with or even have sex with, I can tell that they're into this type. And so I attempt to, with the greatest of intentions, meet that type, that category that I think they want. And here's the very sad truth of it though is that if that person latches onto that type what I am portraying projecting onto them I cannot feel truly loved because my psyche knows that they're not loving my me for my authenticity yeah they're loving what I am giving them they're loving how I'm making them feel they're not loving me yeah and so that, that that automatically creates a barrier I mean you can only get so close mm-hmm yeah. And then I think for people who, you know, they continue to try to just keep the, I guess, to keep the peace, to mm -hmm. keep the relationship, they just kind of sacrifice that part of themselves to the relationship. And it's so sad because usually when I get the other partner in the room, all they want is to really be able to connect with their partner. Yeah. And they don't understand. And there's something incredibly, I think, refreshing and freeing when you can just be who you are <laughs> anywhere, but, you know, especially in relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit and bring in some poetry. David White is one of my favorite poets, and he wrote this beautiful poem called Naming Love Too Early. Um, so I just wanted to read some parts of it, and then we could just, mm -hmm. okay, dialogue, okay. So it is beautiful. It is a beautiful but harrowing human difficulty. Most of our heartbreak comes from attempting to name who or what we love and the way we love. We can never know in the beginning in giving ourselves to a person, to a work, to a marriage, or to a cause exactly what kind of love we are involved with. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? I'm just swooning over here. I think my brain needs to catch up with my feels. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I, and I think that, you know, again... I mean, I remember this. I mean, we did this in high school, you know. Um, we're going together, you know, okay? You know, remember mm -hmm. that phrase, we're going together? Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, it, it, early in a relationship, wanting to ask the other person, okay, where do we stand? Are we, are we together? You know, like wanting to, to know. So true. I'm just thinking about a recent case that I had where a couple who had been friends with benefits for several years um, was really at this impasse because they were afraid to make it official. And I was really trying to process, well, what's what's the fear here? The relationship is just fine. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and it, yeah. And if, I'm not saying that you need a label, but I'm also not saying you don't because here was the, once you hit a certain point, even with your friends with benefits, even with someone that I'm just casually sleeping together, it, at, after a year, certainly, but at this point it was even longer than that, we're attached. Yeah. And so, <laughs> Yeah. If something happened, even though I only see you on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they're still going to feel like a breakup. And so this is where language matters and it also doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> like, right, because right. Because the process was still going to be the same no matter what we called it. Right. But 
on the flip side, by having that, okay, maybe we do want to move into dating and you will be my boyfriend, it allows for the relationship to further deepen because now that commitment creates this boundary, which then provides freedom. Yeah. Does that make sense? I so. love that. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, that whole boundaries give us freedom. That's yes. that's a paradox, and a lot of people struggle with that. So I'm going to ask you to. I know we're doing the poem right now, but not the J's on the Myers Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a whole other podcast. Okay, it is. okay. Um, so talk to me about that a little bit more. How how are boundaries freeing? Boundaries allow the psyche to know exactly how far I can run and it provides the container. It's kind of like looking at water. Water takes on the shape of whatever it's poured into. So depending upon the couple gets to set it, that's the beautiful thing. It's it's only when we attempt to apply too much rigidity or none at all that we don't know where to go. So we've done studies thinking about developmental psychology comes to mind with children. You put children in a really big room with no furniture, <laughs> they all end up clu- uh, <laughs> clustering together in the center of the room. <laughs> like, <laughs> our, our brains just appear hardwired to want to, <laughs> what can I do here? But once we adapted the room to have more structure, the children played freely and roamed, no problem. And I've seen this also in sexual relationships. Like once I, we've had a conversation about, okay, what are we or what do you want? How do we want to play together? It Then I don't have to necessarily ask it. I'm not getting into consent issues, but I'm able to be more creative when I know where the hard limits are. Right. And it's interesting too, I've, I've seen this, is that just having the dialogue about the boundaries and knowing how what the boundaries are. When that dialogue happens in a relationship, for some, just having that dialogue is enough for a while. Like they don't actually need to go. It's true. You know, there's something about knowing, oh, that's the boundary and this is what I can do within the boundary. Okay, cool. You know, it's just- right. I often tell my clients, I'm like, it's kind of like changing a dirty diaper. Like, <laughs> it's awkward, but until you do it, it's not like the rest of us can't smell it. Like- <laughs> And so once you go through the awkwardness, get rid of it, then whoo, free, and relax. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's interesting, you know, you know, we, we started off this podcast talking about, you know, the different names that the Greeks had for the different types of love experiences. And then now here we are with this poem where it talks about basically naming love and putting those limits and, and boundaries. And this last part of the poem is, it goes this way. We name mostly in order to control, but what is worth loving does not want to be held within the bounds of too narrow a calling. In many ways, love has already named us before we can begin to articulate what is occurring, before we can utter the right words or understand what has happened to us or is continuing to happen to us. An invitation to the most difficult art of all, to love without naming at all. Amen, sister friend. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. That just reminds me of an experience I had with a therapist once who she got, I don't know how, but she got very fixated on my relationship with my best friend who's gay. And I spent, my husband at that time was overseas in Dubai. And so I spent a great deal of time with this individual because I did not have the responsibilities of, you know, being at home, yeah, um, taking care of someone else. And so she, because we, in this English language and the culture that we're in, we only have, like you said at the top of the hour, <laughs> we're either friends or we're having sex, was convinced that I was in love with my best friend. And I... I got really frustrated trying to explain over and over. Yes, I'm. I love him. Yeah. But I'm not in love with him. I don't <laughs> want to sleep with him. He does not want to sleep with me. Yeah. We have actually slept at each other's houses, pulling all nighters, studying, and hanging out with our friends. But no. And I um, eventually ended up terminating with her, not just because of that, but I think it's important that other clinicians, the conversation, once again, that we're having is so incredibly important. And that was probably the first time that I woke up to, 
wow, I don't have a word for this. I don't have a file folder for this. It doesn't fit a paradigm. Yeah. I look at him like a brother. Um, he's also an incredibly like close best friend. He also feels kind of like a soulmate in some ways in that we just, we both feel like we've known each other before, but yeah. do we want to have sex? No. Yeah. Again, it's like that deep love, right? That mm -hmm. deep love for someone. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a longstanding love. It's like that pragma again. That, that's the one that, right. that goes over time. I've had a similar experience. I think I probably, sh I think I shared it with you another time when you were talking. Also, um, I would say probably, you know, he is one of my very best friends. And, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, on the, on the outside are just kind of wondering, you know, wow, you, you guys spend time together. You go to dinner together. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's one of the first persons I will call if I, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm having a hard time. And it's really hard for some to understand that, no, we're not having sex. You know, <laughs> that's right. not, that's not even a part of it. And then even harder still for them to understand that, wow, and your husband's okay with that. You know, it's mm -hmm. just really, again, defying like, what does society think of a wife who has a male friend and the husband's okay with it? Like, there's even like a, that's another file folder. It is. Right. What does that say about your husband, right? right? Does that mean that he's cheating or does that mean that he doesn't love you enough because he hasn't <laughs> set a firm boundary? Like I've heard all sorts of randomness yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, just um, I guess the, the, the main points would be that there aren't file folders for everything. And what matters is that it's a healthy relationship. And I think the healthy relationship involves a certain amount of... Um, letting it unfold and letting it be revealed. And then, and also balancing that with the structure and the boundaries at the right time. Almost like you were describing um, the flexibility and stability in a relationship, how you need both. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one of the things with relationship is not trying to name or define and accepting that there are definitions that others may not see and may right. be unique to you. And then at the same time, where does the structure come in? Because I think every relationship does have a structure. You know, there are boundaries to it. Absolutely. Whether it's parent-child, friendship, romantic. It reminds me of that analogy of holding on to something that's incredibly precious, something that's really rare and beautiful to you. You would hold it with a reverence so that it was, you know, you're firm enough, but yet you would also be holding it very gently. Yeah. Because you wouldn't want to crush it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Firm yet gentle. <laughs> that's how I want to be held, Lord. Firm yet gentle. <laughs> I like that. I think that's how I want to be held too. Yes. So what do you think are the gifts for those who are able to open themselves up to different experiences of relationship and uh, not being limited by what maybe we've learned or what society has told us or family of origin? Interesting. So in true Gemini fashion, I'm going to say both depth and transcendence. <laughs> <laughs> you will not get that if you're not open to, I look at it like a tapestry, right? If I'm only coloring and using two colors of thread, uh, it could still be a beautiful picture, but I'm not going to get the richness and the depth if I were open to all of the rest. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You need that to really bring in, um, like you said, those nuances, the the depth, the richness, the complexity. Some of my greatest peak actualization moments have been with another human being, and yeah. whether that's even, I've I've met people. I don't. Even, I can't even say that I've met them. I've had encounters with passing strangers that have so moved me. Some people are probably like, she's pathological. But <laughs> <laughs> it's because of this that there was, an, as there, there was an energetic connection. And I allowed it, you know, and it really, those moments, they add transcendence. Yeah. And again, even that, that those momentary interactions with someone, that's a type of relationship. But it was profound. You know, it was, a, it was an encounter. Again, expanding what is meaningful relationship. Right. Yeah. So Tamara, thank you so much for chatting with me and having this really fun and deep conversation about, you know, defining relationships. It was the best kinds. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Tamara. 
Some of the things that stood out for me include the uniqueness of relationship and how important it is to give ourselves and others permission to experience relationship in a way that is authentic. And these ways may not fit what others say is okay or how others might engage in relationship. One of the things that I can say from my own experience is that relationships that were non-traditional or didn't fit society's norms have been some of the most profound growing experiences for me and I wouldn't be the person I am today without those experiences. Another aspect that stood out for me is how the English language is very limited when it comes to describing the types of love relationships we can experience and that there are gifts in allowing your relationship to reveal itself to you. For show notes to today's episode and for links to the resources mentioned, please visit www.lordisviado.com forward slash women in depth. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.